Well, uh... well, hello, hello, hello. Leavers and believers, welcome to Leaving Hillsong. My name's Tanya and I am super thrilled that you're here. Yay. We have got, there's been a lot going on this week. The 15th and 16th of June saw the con artist formerly known as global senior pastor Brian Charles Houston was in court for the closing arguments of the trial that took place in December for concealing a serious offence, that being the child sexual abuse that was perpetrated by his father, Frank Houston, well, for 40 years, but this is only one count of concealment and the trial took three weeks in December, ran out of time. So Thursday and Friday of this week were the closing arguments for that trial and a decision will be handed down on August 17th. Uh, the delays are due basically to the still the COVID backlog and also to find a time in the diaries where everybody could reconvene. My learned friend Jake Elliott from The Framework and I covered some of that trial under Trials and Tribulations on this very podcast. Uh, by the time we got up to week two, I've still got the recording that I need to edit. It's a very complex matter. Uh, it's not difficult, but there are a lot of parts to it. And We'll actually be going over that. I've got an American consultant who has let me know how a little uh, coverage people outside of the US are getting. So we're actually going to recap it and explain exactly how we got here and different parts of the trial. So if you've got any questions, send us a message because we'll we'll be doing some, you know, really kind of back to basic stuff just so that this thing makes sense to people it has been six months uh there were a lot of steps along the way and it probably doesn't make sense to everybody who isn't inundated as we are in australia and even there there's you know it's it's not necessarily clear how this all started the very fast version of this is the royal commission was held in australia which is similar to an in, just an inquiry, a federal inquiry, and it was held into institutional responses into child sexual abuse. How institutions had responded to allegations and acts perpetrated within their organisation. That Royal Commission came at a huge cost to some people. One of the most outstanding figures in this story is a former police officer. He was a former detective chief inspector. And I'll play you a piece about what happened to him while he was investigating pedophilia in the church. You may remember him from a recent clip in the evangelical rom-com Secrets of Hillsong uh, that was on Hulu recently. There was a meeting held that David Shoebridge MP describes in that movie and uh, Peter Fox stood up and asked for a royal commission because this was some of what he had experienced and before you take a listen to this please understand that there is going to be intense not detailed but ongoing discussion of child sexual abuse and pedophilia in the church so look after yourself first as always detective chief inspector peter fox was in the middle of investigating this matter in 2010 when he was directed to hand over all his evidence to other officers including a statement from a critical witness i sat down with that woman i think for about seven three four hour sessions and typed up a statement and let me tell you, it's explosive. And the material I put together, and finally when I did contact the police department, I was directed to hand that statement over to other people. 
to cease from investigations on that matter and to hand over other documents. I'm so thrilled to present to you today the author of Walking Towards Thunder, the story of a whistleblowing cop who took on corruption and the church. This is Peter Fox. I am so excited today to be joined by Mr. Peter Fox, the former Detective Chief Inspector of Newcastle Police. Well, of the Port Stephens Command is where I was when I finished, and that, which is just outside of Newcastle. So 36 years on the force there before you before you left. That's pretty close to it, uh, <laughs> yes, between 36 and 37. Um, so yeah, how old were you when, you when you joined the job? Oh, well, I was 18. Joined straight from school. 18 when I started at the Police Academy and... Uh, well, I was still 18, actually, when I uh, was deployed. I think I turned 19 a couple of days later, but uh, it was wow. close enough. Yeah. And then, you know, over the course of general police duties, as you move through your career, you come across more and more cases of child sexual abuse. Well, that's it. I suppose, um, you know, as any uh, detective would know, uh, sadly, that's a part of what you encounter. Yeah, the vast, vast majority of those crimes are uh, within families, yep. not so much within institutions. And the vast majority of uh, you know victims or survivors that came in to see me to make complaints or fellow detectives who I, I work with were generally people that uh, had complaints to make about the actions of, you know, whether it be fathers, siblings, uh, grandfathers, uncles, or the man down the street. That was yeah. certainly the uh, the vast majority. Yeah, you know, there were uh, various institutional uh, situations where people would come in, but that opens a different different door so far as the uh, systemic cover up is concerned. You know, all the uh, the survivors, I suppose, regardless of what background they came from, the greatest difficulty they had is uh, not being believed. Mm -hmm. As police, you encounter that so often. I still very much recall. Uh, a young girl from uh, near Curry Curry, when she came forward and made uh, the complaint through uh, Family and Community Services, as it was then, and uh, they brought her into the police station. I can remember her mother just said, uh, you're not welcome back home. The family turned their back on her because um, she wanted to stop what Dad was doing. So, you know, we, we moved from that sort of area where even within families, no one wants to acknowledge, everyone wants to cover it up, make it go away. And then you move into the uh, the bigger realm of where it occurs in institutions. Certainly, so far as the Royal Commission was concerned, predominantly in uh, religious institutions. Yeah. And the situation was no different. Yeah. You know, there was the denial. There was the desire to cover it up. And uh, you know, we've seen uh, time and again the uh, the cover up of the cover up. You know, they went to extraordinary lengths to uh, to do that. And and at what point? You know, you 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 talk about uh, the church being right behind the police station where you were working in Cessnock. At what point do you kind of go, yeah, this this is definite corruption, and, and I've got to do something about it because it's to, to the outsider, it's it's like well, okay for me. I'm so sure you would have seen multiple things along the way in your career that you thought, oh, wish I could fix that, or that needs more work, and how does yeah. this come to a point where you throw everything on the line for it too? I, well, yeah. I don't think it just happens suddenly. It's a, if you like, it's a gradual process where you become aware of uh, things not even over weeks, over years. I think a lot of people uh, just put, if I can use the term, blind faith in their church and uh, whatever they were told or, you know, they, they fully believed that the church was doing something. They'll be proactive about it. They were going to deal with the perpetrator. So, you know, as police, when you start to become involved in those matters, I've got to say, I wasn't initially aware. I, even though I wasn't Catholic, even though I have many Catholics in my family and come from a bit of a mixed background there, you know, you sort of revere uh, people that are within the church. You think they're all going to do the right thing and that they've got the same moral and ethical outlook that you have it took many years to become aware that that wasn't what was what it was occurring you know you mentioned behind Cessna police station that was uh, 
Father Vince Ryan and uh, also uh, Father David O'Hearn were sexually abusing boys whilst they were there. You know, even though it was out the back door, it wasn't sort of somewhere I walked over and seen what was going on in the uh, the church. But, you know, we become aware of the events that were occurring there many years later. And, you know, the first one I had involvement was various ones, but uh, Father uh, Dennis McAlinden, you know, with him, an unusual situation in that uh, he was a, a prolific uh, abuser and I would estimate uh, well in advance of uh, 100 children and including his own family members. So it wasn't just uh, parishioners' children, it was really anyone that he could target. And, you know, that was probably the beginning of my awareness when one of my colleagues, Mark Waters, went to the diocese to try and find out where he was. And as a result of that, um, you know, we were told the church didn't know. Um, he was either in England or he was in Ireland. When they found out, they'd get back to us. And, you know, initially we sort of believed that, thought it was certainly rather odd that a church wouldn't know where one of its own priests was or how to get in contact with him. But as time marched on, uh, we found out that, uh, you know, some years later that, in fact, the church leaders were lying to us, in particular the, um, the bishop of the diocese blatantly lied, said he knew nothing about the uh, the matters when some years later, many years later, nearly a decade later, two survivors, two nieces of Dennis McAlinden actually had signed documents that they were able to uh, to show me that had been provided to the Vicar General of the diocese who, yeah, I can't imagine, would not have, would have shown to his bishop um, who he was working alongside of. And uh, yet we had those denials that, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know what was going on. You know, and they covered that priest up. And, and sadly, he was never ever brought to justice. He uh, he died you know, without ever being arrested and never uh, facing uh, his accusers. Mm, mm. And then, the, you know, you're uncovering more and more of this kind of deception. And it's it's just devastating stuff that they can so blatantly lie and then, and, you know, pop themselves up for mass on Sunday morning and, and carry on so you you find out more and more what leads you to the infamous uh, town hall meeting that it was it was briefly shown on the vanity fair documentary i'll have to send you a clip just that bit there it didn't even highlight who you were but uh there's this wonderful man standing up saying do we need a royal commission no well i, I suppose a, a number of events um as i mentioned you know i was involved in, with cases involving a number of pedophile clergy one of those cases involved another priest by the name of Father James Fletcher. And he raped a number of young boys around the, the Maitland area. And I actually arrested him. He was uh, actually the parish priest in the small town where I now live. So oh. Only 2,000 odd people. but uh, And he'd even married my next door neighbours. Um, so, you know, in small country towns, I suppose that, that occurs. You know, a lot of people were taken aback. I can understand that a lot of people that uh, just revered this man, and some might even say, and I, I probably would suggest as well, that uh, he actually groomed the community. Um, they don't just groom the child, but they yeah, groom their families, the yeah. community. And um, what uh, took me to that meeting is that some family members of the victims, that are, well, the survivors that I, I took statements from in order to convict Fletcher, were there and I had some uh, photographs to return. It was sort of an impromptu uh, decision to go to that meeting because uh, I was aware that those people would be there, but um, I didn't realise that I'd be um, taken away really <laughs> by uh, events that followed. Well, okay, so uh, as I had said to you before, we've got a lot of people from outside of Australia listening to us. So why the demand for a Royal Commission? Why, why is that important in Australia above other forms of inquiry? What can the, I mean, what can the Commission do that... No, well, I, I suppose in short, I'd seen what I believe to be failures of various levels of the, uh, the Catholic Church itself, and it was predominantly the Catholic Church that I dealt with. I actually had some colleagues that had been investigating matters within the Anglican Church as well that had come up against similar barriers to myself. I suppose what really started to concern me is that uh, I, I won't say that I encountered too much interference in when I was wanting to pursue and investigate uh, pedophile clergy, although there was some. But the bigger uh, hassle tended to be um, when I wanted to investigate 
the hierarchy, the bishops and those higher up for the uh, the concealment of those crimes. That's when I uh, felt that there was a lot of resistance. There was a great reluctance and to some degrees interference by senior police. I hadn't really been anticipating that to the degree I encountered. Yeah, and by way of the example, I might just explain that, um, you know, when I'm talking about that, when I charged uh, Jim Fletcher way back in, just I think it was about nine, 2003, somewhere around about there, when I put him before the court, I was actually shocked and surprised that the police prosecutor, who I'd known for many years, in a way started advocating for the priest and asked the, the, uh, the court to uh, issue a suppression order for his name and the fact that he was a member of the Catholic Church, which was not part of my instructions to him. So much so that I actually walked up to the bar table and chastised the prosecutor in front of the magistrate. It wasn't what was... Um, what How was did that though? I mean, th this is the stuff of, uh, I guess, some of our listeners, you know, our worst nightmares that, you know, that you would go to police and and because you know how much courage it takes people to get to that point, they report to police and it gets squashed or quashed or, or shoved down for reasons that aren't really clear. And then people get called paranoid or conspiracy theory if they say, oh, the police are, you know, not doing the right thing. How do you manage something like, like, yeah, how do we take on it's something like that? It's certainly not something that um, is it's certainly not good. It's, it's you know, and when you don't address those uh, those issues, I remember I did a report about the conduct of that police prosecutor. I don't know whether anything really ever came of it. You know, I, that was one level. But as I explained to the um, the Canaan inquiry, which was an inquiry set up by the New South Wales State Government, that when uh, I became aware that two very senior police had been searching my office for a, a church file whilst I was away on leave. And the, I suppose the real test is when I came back to work and was told about that, they were unaware. But I kept thinking, well, are they going to tell me that they were in my office looking for it? And when that didn't occur, I thought, well, something's not right when you have that occurring. But, you know, I was also aware that one of those police had um, incredibly uh, been... Uh, well, in my belief, he certainly uh, was a close friends with a member of the clergy who, as it turned out, was a uh, pedophile and had been raping children. So much so that there was a fundraiser to raise money for that priest's legal funding for his defence of those matters. And um, I actually um, provided an affidavit to the uh, the Canaan Inquiry saying that my information was that that police officer, and a very senior one at that, had uh, made a number of donations to that fundraiser. Now, that's not a criminal offence. Anyone can donate to a fundraiser, but, uh, you know, he's a very senior police officer from the police station where that priest was charged, working <laughs> against what the police were doing in prosecuting that, that clergyman. So, you know, I was aware of all this transpiring in the background. Sadly, you know, you see a lot of things in the police force, more so as you get more and more senior over the years, and not all of it fits with what, uh, a lot of people might describe as, uh, as ethical and right. The police force is no different to a church or any other big organisation. It tries to hide its dirty washing. It doesn't like to air it in public. And when there's a risk of a lot of that getting out there and outside their control and damaging their reputation and undermining public confidence, um, you know, which is what you're alluding to as well, you know, that, that is damaging. But you know, you're sort of saying, well, okay, a lot of survivors of sexual abuse are very uh, reluctant to be able to come in the police station for a myriad of reasons. You know, it's, it's scary. Um, it's not something that they often do, but, uh, you know, they're hoping that the police will believe them, they take them seriously. But, you know, when it, it also gets out that some police, you know, and it might be a very small number out of the whole lot, but if it becomes known that some police have actually worked to undermine that process, yeah. How does that impact other uh, survivors that may be contemplating coming in in the future? And you know, governments and police department hierarchy do not want that out there for that very reason. It's highly damaging, and as a result, uh, you know, they enter into the same uh, trap that the church has entered into. They cover it up.
they don't uh, let the public know what, what has transpired rather than dealing with the issue and making an example and sending a message to other police or, or whoever it might be that those sort of things won't be uh, tolerated and they'll take action. You know, covering it up, of course, sends a different message because, you know, police are, like any organisation, they, uh, they, they talk, um, they whisper behind the scenes. And if they're aware that the hierarchy has looked after a police officer that's been doing the wrong thing, uh, they're thinking, well, that's how it's done. That's, and it tends to uh, perpetuate those sorts of things happening into the future, in my belief, anyway. It's terrifying. This is stuff that, I mean, that that just terrifies me. I'm not frightened of Hillsong. I am frightened of police. I said to you before, I was raised, I was born in South Africa. My mother always taught me to be terrified of police. They take you away in the middle of the night if you say anything. And then we come here and it's, you know, free and transparent except it's not exactly and I mean there were so many concerns when you know when Scipioni was Andrew Scipioni was the police commissioner uh and he had very strong open ties to to Hillsong for a time that you know he was uh the police commissioner of New South Wales Scott Morrison who had listed Brian as his mentor was um, the Prime Minister, all at the same time, and it appeared to offer people in Hillsong some, or, you know, high-level high members some kind of protection. And, you know, it, it affects me, I guess, directly. It affects a lot of us because when people report assaults, sexual assaults, all kinds of crimes that have taken place in this organisation, and they want to then go and report, but, People are hesitant because they think the police is the, the police force has a number of members in Hillsong. That we know Hillsong hire police for private events to police pri marshal private events, and that you know there's there are forces like you're speaking about at higher levels that might interfere with that huge question. But but what do you say to people like? you know, that have those kinds of concerns about engaging police, you know, where they well, need um, to. Well, that is the difficult part. You know, I'm not trying to display quite the opposite. I'm, I, I would like to believe that everybody uh, that wanted to uh, report what occurred to them uh, could have faith in the police. You know, and I, I want to emphasise that the amount that are doing the wrong thing, uh, the numbers are minuscule uh, compared okay. to the overall number. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it certainly uh, undermines when uh, when those odd occasions uh, occur where police are doing the wrong thing. And yeah, uh, I, in my view, um, I don't think it was a, a great image when uh, you actually have the police uh, police commissioner, you know, mingling with uh, members of uh, a particular uh, church, and particularly one that was coming under scrutiny for all the wrong reasons. Those sort of uh, images aren't uh, aren't great to be out there publicly. Yeah, whether there was anything more to it, I don't know. I don't think that the uh, the public were uh, uh, thrilled, and, and maybe it's one of those things whereby you know we talk about separation of state and church. The line becomes very blurred a lot of the time. You know, um, I've got some fairly strong ideas on whether uh, you know Parliament should be opened uh, with a prayer. You know, should you know senior members of the uh, judiciary, judges and, and lawyers, be attending uh, red mass? with the Catholic Church at the opening of, uh, you, know, you know, the judicial period for the year. You know, the optics of all that to a lot of people are good and you wonder uh, how much influence. You know, is it purely ceremonial that they're going through or is there a little bit more to it? There's always there's always more. So you're, I mean, so you're suggesting that people should feel fairly safe to come forward and report i mean there's concerns that even like the local police station is you know influenced by the local church well i can't say that that doesn't exist i certainly encountered one instance where that was the case are there more i don't know um i would hope not but one would think that if there was one there'd have to be more but you know i've often had these debates with um you know various people my you know i've discussed things with my my family my brother uh, who was a plumber you know, probably put it uh, quite succinctly, he said, uh, listen, I work with people, he said, some of the best mates, uh, friends, good guys they ever worked with, he said, but uh, equally so, they were absolute assholes. He said, I wanted nothing to do with, and he said, you know, you can have all the screening you like, 
but the reality is police forces are drawn from the community. And so you're, you're going to get that cross-section of people out there. Yeah, we'd like only the good ones to join. But, Juice, how do you set up a mechanism whereby you can guarantee uh, that's going to happen? And uh, yeah. you know, once they're there and uh, if they've got in, in a position, but, you know, as, as I said before, like I've encountered so many wonderful police that uh, put their heart and soul into yeah. investigations. They're compassionate, the time they spend with survivors and their uh, enthusiasm in pursuing those matters. Yeah, and, and again, harping back to that, I find that the amount of police, that, you know, my belief is, you know, there would only be a, a, a handful or so of police that would, you know, do the wrong thing. Good news. Yeah, yeah the difficulty is when things start to become formalised and you start to go over after the heads of an organisation, then it's got to be more widely known within uh, police forces and government because of the nature of that investigation and, and that, you know, in a way, uh, is an alert to anyone that may have a vested interest that's um, within the hierarchy of those organisations that they then have an opportunity to uh, to interfere if they so desire. And, uh, yeah, that's disappointing. Uh, yeah, that was the thing that really stuck in my craw. And, uh, yeah, that was the major motivator for why I, um, I spoke out. But even that, even though I speak publicly, um, you know, and I've never read, ever held back you know i revealed a number of things to the uh, the government inquiry but only to find that the inquiry set up by the government removed a lot of the evidence out of my affidavit that i felt was crucial to as to explaining why i took the stand i did you know one of the other police that was uh, placed in charge of the investigation after all it was taken from me um, and that is the investigation into the cover-up of uh Dennis McAlinden, the pedophile priest that was moved overseas and, and hidden from us until after his death. Well, the, the police officer uh, had actually uh, had departmental investigations for previously in, unethically interfering in another separate serial pedophile investigation. Now, you know, I wanted to ask that the police force at that inquiry and, and, and have the, uh, the inquiry ask the question is, why would the police force place somebody with those sort of convictions in charge of another pedophile investigation. Why was it moved, removed from a detective that uh, had background knowledge of the uh, the case to given to somebody that had previously had nothing to do with it, yet had a, uh, a tainted background? But that was all outlined in my affidavit. But sadly, that was removed by the inquiry. Um, I was told that that wasn't relevant. I wasn't allowed to say that in the uh, the inquiry the public and the media never got to know about it but i've got no hesitation in uh, in speaking out about it and saying well that's what happened what why tell me where this courage comes from please i mean we're talking about a police acting like almost at times like a law unto themselves at higher levels that you can't actually pinpoint or do anything with where does this come from i mean uh, sorry i i um you know, we all have a healthy fear of authority. You're really poking the hornet's nest and not holding back. Literally, in terms of personal safety for you and your family, how do you feel safe? How do you proceed? Well, you know, it was a scary time. Um, I don't deny that. You know, we certainly had heavy security doors installed. We had video cameras installed around our house. And that's terrible, I have to say, when you're uh, you're a police officer and you're feeling fearing from other police. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, we've had that. That scenario, but yeah, I, I've often sat down, uh, Tanya, and, and examined myself and asked myself the question: um, Why? Why did I feel the need to stand up? And you know, you're saying courage, but whether it's that, I, I, I just think that something inbuilt within all of us in that uh, we have a sense of what's right and what's wrong. You know, these days I was raised a Christian. I called myself Christian probably uh, for most of my life. I'm now agnostic. Where do I think it comes from? I, it's not a God-given thing. Um, no, it's something no. that we all have, that we can all make a judgment and say, yeah, that is wrong. You look at something, the decision comes down, well, okay, um, there's going to be ramifications if I do something about trying to promote what is right. And that's a difficult one for a lot of people. I, I don't criticise them. I'm able to stand up and, uh, and on their digs and, and call it out. But there are a lot of people like myself that do. You know, I've spoken to 
people in different fields outside of the police. Yeah, but the people police like, is a, <laughs> ah, you know. Well, well, many of them are, but, uh, you know, I talk about Jeff Morris, who was the whistleblower for the Banking Royal Commission, uh, Troy Stoltz, who worked for Clubs New South Wales, and they took him on. Um, I think he lost his home and everything else through the legal process. Yeah, and then at the moment, we've got another uh, whistleblower. If people haven't heard of him overseas, a fellow by the name of David McBride, who came forward and disclosed war crimes occurring in Afghanistan committed yes. by some rogue Australian soldiers. Now, those rogue Australian soldiers, that there's now video footage of them committing crimes. Others that uh, there's been testimony by fellow soldiers, but they haven't been criminally charged. Uh, the one that has been criminally charged is David McBride, uh, the oh, officer that re yes. reported it. Now, I know that there's been petitions delivered to the Attorney General saying, well, stop this persecution. Why is the whistleblower being the one? And they're prosecuting him under the... Uh, you know, disclosing of uh, military secrets. But, geez, um, hang on, uh, the military secret, he'd gone to two senior or two separate levels in the military saying, you know, you need to do something. This fellow has been committing war crimes and he sees they're doing nothing. So the alternative is, you know, probably like myself, David has then got to ask the question, okay, I know what is right and I know what is wrong. And if I stand up here and go public, if I go to the media and do what's right, there will be uh, pushback and there'll be reprisals. And sadly, that, that's exactly what's occurred. But the Australian public are now so much more aware and, like he, absolutely appalled at what's gone on. The vast, vast majority of Australians uh, support this man. Yet here we are in a, in a world where we can't understand why a whistleblower is being the one prosecuted. It makes no sense. And, and they didn't afford you whistleblower legislation either or protection there, did they? Well, well, that's the part of the problem with um, whistleblower legislation. We have not only state legislation, uh, we also have federal legislation you know, under the obscure sort of acts, Protected Interest Disclosures Act. Now, like most uh, whistleblowers, I actually hadn't sat down and thought about what was going to happen or how it was going to unfold. I hadn't thought, well, hang on, I want to be a whistleblower. No one does that. Events overtake them and you come out and you say things and you know, the way the politicians have drawn up these these acts, and I, I dare say that it's simply for um, you know, window dressing for the public uh, to sort of say, oh, we're trying to look after them when they're really not. You know, the loops that people have to jump through, um, people like David McBride um, have been to two levels of the military. In my case, I had uh, I had been to different uh, police trying to take things up. The reason I didn't go higher is I knew some of those very senior police were the ones that had searched my office that had very um, dubious yeah. backgrounds. But the politicians have written it up so that technically, for me to be protected under that act, I had to have approached people that I suspected of being involved. And, you know, and, and it's been very frustrating because we've seen it both at state level and just recently federal level where the federal attorney general made a lot of promises about the Whistleblowers Act before the election. When he's come in, he's done very minuscule little twinks to the act that we don't believe goes anywhere near looking after whistleblowers. You know, it's, it's so he can turn around the next election and say, oh, yeah, we've, we've done this. Uh, we promised it, we've done it. But I'm yet to hear or see the Attorney General say, listen, let's sit down with some whistleblowers. Let's actually talk to some of those that have been through it and see what they think needs to be done for their protection. That doesn't happen because, yeah. In my, my view, I'm sorry, but I don't believe politicians really do want to protect whistleblowers. There are things out there that they feel will damage public confidence and possibly even their standing as politicians. And yes, they'll give it lip service, but really, do they genuinely really want to make changes that in future uh, could free people up to say things that might not sound real good to uh, you know, for their future careers? It just sounds like Australia's the Wild West in some ways. Is it? Is it? Has it changed in two hundred years from this penal colony? Oh, no, well, people like to make comparisons to um, <laughs> you know, even in um, New South Wales, we had uh, an event or period in our history that was referred to as the Rum Corps. Many referred back to that and said that was the origin of New South Wales Police, and in many ways well, it was. Well, they, they policed the state. Um, we're two hundred odd years on. 
and uh, many of the uh, the terrible conduct that we witnessed has has continued on. We had a uh, New South Wales Police Royal Commission in the uh, the mid nineteen nineties that uh, disclosed horrendous corruption. And sadly, you know, I I, I lived through that era, um, having joined back in the seventies. I saw all that, and I lived with hope that uh, we would have a better police force and a better uh, you know, safer community after it. But it's gradually um, slid back to where it used to be. Okay, you think so? All right, because you know it was supposed to be all cleaned up after that, and all better now. Uh, uh, so, all right. So, I mean, we are we're ten years down the track from that from that meeting. We're looking back, so I mean, we we end up with a royal commission into the institutional responses into child sexual abuse, and that's. Really, the the key point of all this, isn't it? I mean, it's 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 not just that things have taken place. It's exactly what happens when people. I wonder if the police shouldn't have been part of that inquiry. Oh, you'll actually find that I actually asked that very question myself of uh, uh, the Royal Commission of Peter McCullough and uh, Gail Finesse. I actually asked, "Is the police force an institution?" and uh, the response I got back was some words to the effect of, um, that's a very good question. <laughs> I think the great difficulty was that as much as the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, I think probably would have or maybe had the police force as one of those that was open to that, the premiers of the various states weren't. And uh, I know it was made very clear in New South Wales because they'd set up an inquiry to specifically look at the allegations I raised of what was occurring here in the Hunter Valley. And sadly, that was excluded. The Royal Commission was not allowed to look at that, simply because the Premier said, well, hang on, we have our own inquiry here. And part of the agreement was that the states, well, New South Wales at least, wasn't handing over power to the Commonwealth Royal Commission to investigate matters from that were canvassed by their inquiry. You know, and you sit back and you think, well, you know, surely that doesn't happen that way. Here am I preparing an affidavit with all these peripheral things that had occurred, yet I actually see a government inquiry uh, removing all that evidence bit by bit from my affidavit saying, you cannot give evidence about that. You know, one stage there where I did blurt some of the, it out from the witness box, it was immediately struck from the record. Um, you won't read that. doesn't mean it didn't happen. It definitely happened. But, you know, are there evidence where I had... There was a copy of a um, one of MacLinden's nieces had actually written a complaint to the police force. And in it, she actually says that the police have treated me worse than the church. Now, bearing in mind, this is the investigation that was taken off me. Mm. And she suggests in it that her treatment was such that she was getting the impression that they were hoping that she would uh, withdraw it and, and back away. Now, obviously, that would have lent a, a fair bit of uh, weight to what I was arguing in that, you know, they weren't really, they didn't have their hearts in the investigation. Yet that letter was produced by another party at the inquiry. You won't read about it and you won't see it. It was struck from the record. None of that appears in the final report, but it happened. That letter was handed to that inquiry. So you, you then have to ask yourself, what has really gone on there? Was that how that inquiry was intended to, uh, to be conducted? Um, like if it was to look into why I made a public stand to speak out about the failure of New South Wales Police, in my case, to investigate the alleged cover-up of child sexual abuse within the uh, the church. Surely matters that I've raised of the conduct and history of some of those police that were in charge of it and letters such as the one I've just mentioned that was written by one of the survivors uh, as a complaint to the police force. Surely that should have been aired and that should have been made public and that should have gone, you know, in my view, towards my credit. But with it all struck from the record, of course, you know, I was criticised for having conducted uh, part of my investigation in secret. That is, I didn't tell my commander that I suspected uh, was raising money for the legal defence of a priest. But, you know, that's the way it worked. I suppose at the time, I, I know it did. It, uh, it took a huge personal toll on myself and my family. But I suppose the thing you've got to walk away is that uh, did I actually go public to sort of place myself in a position of, oh, I don't know, uh, 
uh, kudos or whatever. No, and that wasn't what the goal was about. Well, I think um, that's fairly clear. Yeah. And, and even though they, uh, you know, my reputation was uh, was criticised, and uh, you know. And certainly it did stop up from the uh, the final report of that inquiry. That wasn't why I stood up on that podium that day and said what I did. It was for the survivors. It was for their families. It was to see a raw commission and uncover the veil that had been spread by the, uh, the various institutions, uh, covering up the crimes of their their priests, their, uh, their clergymen, their, their staff and their workers, whoever it was. And we achieved that. And, and I suppose looking back, okay, they knocked a bit of bark off me. But, you know, I got up, I, um, it took me a little while, I brushed it off and I've moved on. And, uh, you know, certainly I would have liked to have spent a lot more years in the police force. And, and again, that's one of the laments I have in that um, I was certainly getting to the end of a, uh, a fairly long career. And you look at anyone, whether it's myself or whoever, that has a, a, a good ethical, a moral outlook and you think what can i impart um you know how can i help young police joining how can i show them how can i teach them you know and i think that role model role is extremely important but i was forced out of the police force and that's one of the things that concerns me in terms of sorry just outline for us like how did that come about i mean this is again another cost there's so much cost well, to this you. well it comes about for many things but certainly the harassment you know i've had Many police refused to shake my hand and, uh, and openly hostile towards me. You know, it was impossible to go back into that work environment after that. But at the same yeah. time, the police that I had outlined, um, who had, you know, the one with the convictions for unethically interfering in another pedophile investigation, not only remained in the police force, he was promoted, and uh, later on he was uh, given Australia's highest honour honor on the. Uh, the Queen's Birthday's Honours List for a National Police Medal. Now, I sort of sit back and roll my eyes and say, are we actually giving medals to police that have done those sorts of things? But that's one thing. But the other thing that uh, really sticks in my craw is that, that the police force knew of his history, yet they promoted somebody like that. And what does that say about the type of role models that the police force is then left with. So if they're getting people that stand up for good, you know, ethical and moral reasons and saying we don't want them there, but we, we do want people that we've found wrongdoing with, what does that say for the future uh, training and tuition of our young police coming in? What are they going to impart? That aspect is something that will probably always sit very awkwardly with me. Um, it's still stuck in my craw that that's what happens. And it has happened and is known by very senior police right to the top. Yet I've had to, uh, to say, well, you know, I've done what I can. Uh, there was no more I could do from position. And I'm, I'm happy with the uh, position I took. And, you know, if the legacy I, I have left, and I hope it is, is that the veil got ripped away from much of what was occurring within institutions. People... That is, the general community now look at uh, a survivor when they stand up and, and talk about the sexual abuse that occurred to them. And the community now, you know, different to what occurred before, will now say, we believe you. That's what it's matters. Absolutely incredible change, even looking at some of the footage from, I mean, it's only nine, ten years ago. And this concept that, you know, survivors were going to come forward and and speak their story you know it was still amazing in the community i i believe it's a a world-changing event and even for someone like me i had people report sexual assault at ilsong and apart from you know encouraging counseling or a historical report to police there was nothing there was nowhere there was nowhere to place this culturally and you know, that's what this Royal Commission gave to so many people is, you know, almost the language and the and the reality of it being named, being created. Brilliant, brilliant legacy. And, and gratitude just doesn't doesn't um doesn't cover it. Now looking over it as well, I mean, we are looking at this week, uh, Brian Houston's case is back in court for closing arguments. And there's a, there's a bit of debate amongst the old schoolers that, you know, he's got a, a his father's crimes are getting pinned on him. He's being singled out for, for something from a very long time ago. And 
you know, he's done his best or something and why are they pursuing this relatively minor charge of concealment against somebody? And, yeah, I was just wondering if you could tell me a bit about the concealment factor, you know, in all of this and how much it plays into people getting away with crimes. Well, certainly, and, and again, you know, and I don't mean to keep harping back to uh, the Catholic Church. Um, you know, there's many other uh, perpetrators uh, and institutions out there, but I suppose, you know, as I said earlier, that was the one I predominantly... Um, They're a great uh, model. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, if you look at events that unfolded down in Victoria, um, you had a one little town of Ballarat where, uh, you know, umpteen perpetrators uh, abusing kids over decades, and it was known. It was known uh, by not just the survivors, the kids them, themselves, but uh, the hierarchy of the church. And, you know, the Royal Commission showed that, that uh, not only did they know, they actually moved the perpetrator to a new parish where more kids were abused. Now, you know, when you've got cover-up, I suppose that's the big uh, problem, is that it's one thing to, to cover up, it's one thing to conceal and not report a crime. But then you're allowing that perpetrator to remain out there. Yeah, every perpetrator is going to tell, um, you know, whether it be a bishop or a monsignor or, oh, I won't do that again. <laughs> They're pedophiles. They have something that went within them that uh, makes them want to continue to commit those crimes. And so I, I think that, that in itself says that if, you, if you're covering up for a pedophile, you're technically allowing more kids in the future to be abused and um, and that's why they need to, to be held for account there seems to be um, a great legal barrier in being able to to do that sadly we even had the high court in australia overturn a jury decision uh, for a clergyman higher courts overturned the conviction of philip wilson mm. uh, the bishop mm. of adelaide that was involved in one of the, you know the matter i was in charge of even though the uh, the court convicted him on appeal, a judge uh, sits there and says, well, you know, on those legal grounds, I'm overturning that. And they both walk free. You know, the public is still very much divided. But I'm thinking if we can't show that our judicial system upholds the uh, the values and the expectations of the community, we're in a very uh, dangerous phase. And, you know, Brian Houston certainly knew of the crimes of his father, Frank. He's admitted that. He knew about it. And that's before the court. I won't say too much more. But, yeah, the uh, the closing arguments and uh, the final uh, verdict that's got to be brought in as to uh, his guilt or otherwise, I think a lot of the community up there are very much uh, waiting with bated breath. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a first time as such testing out these laws, if you care to say. What, what kind of outcome do you see? The... A lot of people are saying, you know, is he going to go to prison? And it's a very different system from, from the US, of course. Their um, incarceration seems to be a lot more severe. And well, I, I, you know, and, and again, I'm a little bit reluctant because it is something that's um, still before the court and uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to prejudice whatever's yeah. going on there. We've, we've had, sadly, that occur in, in other cases that have been very high profile of late and, uh, you know, people can cause mistrials, you know, speaking too much about it but um, you know I, I'm, I'm certainly sitting back waiting to see what uh, what transpires you know as you and many others know um, Brian Houston is very well connected he's got a lot of very powerful and influential friends I'm hoping that those factors don't weigh into what will occur in the judicial process we'd all like to think that that's not but um, you know a lot of Australians have heard the evidence that was before the Child Abuse Royal Commission and we've heard the evidence that have gone before the uh, the trial so let's wait and see. It will be just, interesting. When you were saying appeal, and I just, you know, that's, I guess, my concern is that so many times we see that in Australia that people will get a conviction and then automatically goes to appeal and some technicality can be can be pulled out, which, oh, yeah, I guess I won't kind of... It's, it is very frustrating and it's very hard for a lot of people, but, you know, I can't criticise that process in itself. I support it. It's, yeah, it's necessary you know, for when things go wrong. But I think that, you know, the great thing is that it needs to be transparent. You know, some of the ones I know have left a lot of Australians really questioning um, how our process works. Um, you know, when you have um, you know, the reason juries were set up back in 
English law, which is where they were first introduced, was that people had lost faith in a king uh, presiding over Tom's things. And so you have 12 uh, members, you know, randomly picked from the committee that uh, your peers, the judge. But when you have a court saying, well, hang on, on no other basis than we've now listened to the evidence as well, and we've come up with a different idea than what you did, and we're going to overturn your verdict. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's a very dangerous ground to be travelling down. Yeah, they can uh, argue other little bits of technicalities into it, but when you've got a jury that hears, hears it all, isn't that what our system of uh, justice is, is ultimately based around? Yeah, it's a hard, hard pill to swallow. And, I mean, I've got a million questions, but I, I won't hold you up too much longer. Tell me something, though, because it, it keeps coming back to me. A lot of evangelical churches are focused on forgiveness, Tell me what it's like when you encounter a perpetrator and he's in his 70s or 80s and he's old and frail now. I mean, do you, you know, and there's that kind of, oh, you know, why are you harping on this or how can an old man pay for such crimes? The police have a very different point of view from that forgiveness point of view. What, what's your take on that? Oh, no, and, and that's always a, a very valid argument. I'm sure okay. that... Uh, you know, that went on, um, as we we may recall in a different uh, sort of forum, is that you know, World War Two was uh, decades old. Yes. Yet, um, you know, the crimes that were committed surrounding the Holocaust. Yes, a lot of the uh, the Nazis and the uh, the concentration camp commandants and, and others, it didn't diminish the gravity of of what they did. And you know, the Israelis for decades after continued to pursue them. Yeah, you know, I I have sat down. You know, as a, as a police officer, it's uh, it's a different jo job. You've got to put aside your uh, your emotions for most of the time. You know, I remember travelling down in Juno Jail and interviewing uh, Father Vince Ryan. I've got to say that uh, I enjoyed my conversation with him. Here he was serving an immense amount of time for uh, child sexual abuse, but I found him very honest, upfront, frank. Um, he's one of the few um, pedophile offenders that admitted his crimes. He didn't put his victims through the ordeal of having to stand in the sit in the witness box and being cross examined. And you know, my interview with him was very insightful as to the uh, the workings of uh, a pedophile of that nature and how they operated. So yeah, but does that make me say I've got some sympathy for what he's done? No, I don't. Yeah, you know, he was where he was meant to be. Um, I remember the day I interviewed him, he walked into the room, the interview room at the jail with two black eyes. And I've just sort of said, uh, you know, have you walked into a door? Uh, that's usually the explanation. And he, um, for whatever reason, he obviously felt that it was part of his penance. He said, I, it happens all the time. And I just put it down that I deserve it. Um, and I thought, wow, very, very odd. But that was the view he expressed with me. And um, if we can't count on much in Australia, we can always hope for a bit of jail justice. Yes. Well, Oh, uh, sorry, I should <laughs> make you comment on that. The cost versus the, the benefits, which are so hard to measure on either side, was it worth it? Oh, absolutely. There'll never be a regret in my mind, um, you know, despite all the fallout and the negative uh, ramifications of, of what occurred. You know, that, that's for me, my family, um, they felt it. You know, they, mm. they, I, I held them right up there with it all. But, geez, um you know, sometimes, um, you know, occasionally people will come up to me um, and congratulate me. As I said, I've, I've copped some negatives as well, uh, mainly from uh, from police officers uh, that weren't real keen on what happened. But, uh, you know, the overwhelming uh, thing in my mind is the, um, the way that survivors of child sexual abuse are now being believed, they're being supported, uh, yeah. the awareness around it, and the, the revelation of how ugly it really is inside many of these churches the public's no longer under any illusions it's known so it wasn't worth it there'll never be a doubt in my mind um, yeah absolutely. wonderful yeah one and i mean it's been such a wonderful conversation because you've been giving us easy answers you've said yeah these are the problems but you know push ahead anyway before you leave us is there any kind of words of wisdom or advice for people who want to speak but are afraid of all these things that you've said well, I think you're just going to sit down and say, what is right? Um, you know, when, when it comes to a specific case where um, a survivor of uh, child sexual abuse is, is contemplating what they should do, it's never easy. 
and they've got to do what is best for them. And sometimes that may mean they make a decision not to go to the police. They don't want to make it public. You know, that wouldn't be what I would choose for them, but it's not about me. It's about them, and uh, they've got to do what they feel is right. You know, certainly go out there, um, certainly get advice, listen to people, um, take on board uh, a lot of it. You know, I've had many discussions over the years. I'm still a... Um, an advocate. I uh, I work with a number of uh, child abuse advocacy groups. You know, even this week um, I've got some meetings with child abuse uh, survivors who want to just run some things past me. Um, I'm happy to do that, but it doesn't always mean that they're going to take all of my advice and do the things I want. And, and nor would I expect that to happen. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's up to them. And uh, yeah, but I would hope that the judicial process, and that's one avenue, does provide a lot of healing doesn't provide at all, uh, will yeah. never ever heal 100%, but if they feel that's the course for them, I'd strongly uh, encourage them to do so. But there are other avenues as well, and yeah, and maybe that's the other thing, having mentioned those uh, advocacy groups. I, I've met such wonderful, wonderful people that work with them, uh, the Blue Knot Foundation, um, Clan, um, Samson, a group called Can at Newcastle, many, many others. They have a great insight on how all this works and they've got some wonderful supportive staff and counsellors out there you know if you know, people are sort of thinking which way can i go i know it's all confidential but i'll sit down and talk to you about it and uh, give you a lot of support and a lot of guidance that's terrific i will yeah. let you have the rest of your day thank you so much on behalf thank of you, the survivors Tanya. listening and just so many people that you know you have changed our history thank you so much thank you, have, I'll leave you with it. Uh, I'll have to make that call back now. <laughs> have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it, leavers and believers. He's a very, very busy man, and I know you will have appreciated that he took the time to hang out with us. Thank you so much to Peter, and, uh, yeah, like I said, gratitude just doesn't cover it for the historical and cultural impact that his taking a stand has has affected in this country and dare I say, yeah, around the world. It's affected other commissions and inquiries and just incredible what, uh, what one man can do. So I'm sure you found that as inspiring as I did. My heart just filled while I was like editing and yeah, wow, uh, just such, a, such an opportunity to be with someone who, you know, so humble so powerful thank you so much everyone for being here for sharing in this conversation and for just carrying on through all these uh interesting and and tough times these are rough seas at the moment you're not alone everyone's feeling it so while this was a heavy one super inspiring one thank you as always for your support Huge shout out to the patrons. Thank you so much. The uh, the Patreon's growing and it's just so helpful for getting this message out. There's loads more content to come. Keep an eye out on social media because it's the nature of this that it's a little bit haphazard. So just got to do what we can do. I wanted to have a quick note on the kindness thing before I launch into that. It never occurred to me because I've got this thing where like I think everything's really obvious. I don't get why people don't see everything the same way as me. So um, I never intended the kindness thing to be any kind of like soft touch. I was really worried when the carnage started with the, the great big resignations and stuff. You know, there were relationships at stake and it just didn't seem worth it to get like Houston derangement syndrome and, you know, lose friends or relatives or anything over it. And that little bit of kindness and can just kind of help. But the most interesting thing that I found is that, well, kindness is a superpower. So if anybody is just relentlessly or irrationally nasty to you or even whatever just be kind to them just be nice to them it is the most disarming thing in the world give it a try this week see how it works nasty people don't have much ammunition really to come back with so 
keep on being nice to them. Show them some empathy. You know, get them on the side. It's the Pentecostal way. Peter's book is called Walking Towards Thunder, the true story of a whistleblowing cop who took on corruption in the church. And I think you'll find him mainly on Twitter. Hmm. Bye.